Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this Medical Center Hour uh, called Anonymity versus Continuity, Bringing the Patient Back into the Doctor's Education. Sounds like a novel idea. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and I'm happy to wel welcome you all here today, and very happy especially to welcome uh, UVA School of Medicine alumnus uh, back to Charlottesville. Um, this is our first annual Brody Forum on medical education, a cornerstone in this medical education week that we're celebrating here at the UVA School of Medicine. Another major activity this week is the Medical Education Research Poster Exhibit, which is in the corridor alongside the Health Sciences Library. I encourage you to, to pay a visit and look at all the posters from number zero all the way through to the end. Um, there's a reception uh, at five today for all the exhibitors and faculty uh, in the library. We are really delighted to welcome Dr. David Hirsch back to UVA from Boston where he's been since 1995. David is a 1992 graduate of the School of Medicine, and he's now on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School and based at the Cambridge Health Alliance, a Harvard-affiliated clinical site. He's with us this week as a visiting professor of medical education and uh, becomes later today the first recipient of the medical school's Brody Award in medical education. Medical science and healthcare delivery have changed dramatically in recent decades, but medical school's ways of educating students in the clinical sciences differ remarkably little today from the time of Osler and Flexner a full century ago. But some medical, student, medical schools are now breaking out of that mold to create new clinical education models that not only uphold the values of Osler and Flexner, but also take account of and respond to recent research in the learning sciences and fundamental shifts in healthcare delivery. These new models offer continuity in both learning and human relationships, including the doctor-patient relationship, and create longitudinal integrated structures within which the students learn, practice, are mentored, and form their professional identity. In a learning environment that emphasizes personal duty and authentic, meaningful roles for students, the patient once again becomes central to the doctor's education in a way that both inspires the students to learn and empowers them in caring for their fellow beings. So in this Medical Center Hour, Dr. Hirsch, who co-founded and co-directs the Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship for Harvard Medical School students at the Cambridge Health Alliance, will explore these momentous shifts in clinical instruction and their impact on young doctors, their teachers, and their patients. And I dare say our former student will have some lessons for us today. Welcome, David. So th thanks, Marcia, very much. Thank you to you all for, um, for coming. I realize I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I violated exactly the thing I intended to do this week when I arrived here. So I'm coming down route or route 29. I'm thinking, you know, whenever I get close to UVA, I get more excited than ever. I'm getting more excited now than even I was in the last time I was here. I've got to just not talk too much. I've got to just stay calm. I'm so excited. And of course, I arrived on Monday or Sunday night, and I've been talking ever since. And it's um, that was that was not my intention, but I hope you can, those of you who are here for the second and third time, experience it for what it really is, which is that I'm just so delighted to uh, come on back. So I'm also delighted to share with you this little project that we, we got into several years ago. Um, I think it meshes well with the theme that Marcia had intended, the theme that you see up here. So I'm going to try to go through it um, more calmly than my last uh, endeavors. So the Harvard Medical School Cambridge Integrated Clerkship, it perhaps as an example of, of answering this question about anonymity versus continuity, and certainly it was our hope to bring the patient back into the center of the student doctor's education. Now, not, as you know, life in, involves communities. And this project simply would not have happened if it weren't um, for Barbara Oger, my uh, co-director, colleague, friend, mentor, guide, uh, <laughs> nearly roommate, um, and all of our other colleagues at the Cambridge Health Alliance who helped with the program. I've not listed here are the chiefs who were very, very willing to accept disruptive change. Not listed here are the deans and associate deans and assistant deans from Harvard Medical School who are willing to try to take on the challenge of a school that they loved, to take on the challenge of changing it. And I can tell you there are countless others who I'm sure I have forgotten, but in the spirit of um, recognizing that nothing's ever done by an individual, 
I want to just tip my hat to these people. All right, so here's how we will do it today. The call of Flexner, the case for change, a review of ethical erosion, the voice of a student, another call, more ancient even than Flexner, the call of Maimonides, the philosophy of educational continuity, the model of the HMS Cambridge Integrated Clerkship. Now, it's, it's not HMS as in a ship in England, right? This is Harvard Medical School. More student voices, and then a call from the IOM. These calls, by the way, are in no particular order of importance to me. Um, I, will, I will say one last thing, um, which is in the, in the student voices here, I'm perfectly content. I'm very happy, in fact, if you all want to raise points that you're feeling after hearing the students speak, we could, we could stop at any moment. But those might be very good moments for you to, to um, say what you're feeling, because I think they're kind of evocative. All right, so we'll start with Flexner. <coughs> To sample a school on its clinical side, one makes in the first, in the first place, straight for its medical clinic, and by that he means the hospital, the inpatient center part of a hospital. Seeking to learn the number of patients available for teaching, the variety of conditions that they illustrate, and the hospital regulations, insofar at least as they determine two things. Continuity of service on the part of the teachers of medicine. The closeness that the student may follow the individual patient. Now, if we just, I, I can't help but sort of pull out my personal biases. Doink. So in yellow here, you see my personal biases. I think it's interesting he raises the number of patients available for teaching, the variety of the conditions, the continuity of service with, the continuity of con connection with the teachers, and the closeness of the student to the patient. The last of which you might note is what we're going to get into today a little bit, I hope, most powerfully with the voices of my students. Okay, this case for change is not a mystery to any of you. I know this. It's been documented again and again and again by leaders and thinkers across the fields of medicine in very high-level reports over many, many years. We know what's happening. Inpatient training has changed dramatically. The inpatient venue has changed dramatically in, the case, in its basic job, which is to be a service delivery place. But inpatient training has changed so dramatically that now alone it is incomplete as being the source of education for the core, the basic core, um, training for what we call you know, third-year students or the principal clinical experience or, or the, whatever you want to think of as that main clinical year. So I want to say up front, this is not an appeal to throw out inpatient training, not at all. And in the papers we wrote, we don't say that. It's not suggesting that inpatient training isn't highly valuable. The way you choose the word incomplete purposefully. It's also not to say that we, we want a system that has no inpatient training for any number of other reasons, we think it should simply be developmentally in a different place. We think it should be in the fourth year. We think inpatient training actually is pre-internship training. If you want to understand the core transcendent values, the core transcendent skills of doctoring, you would not learn those best in an inpatient venue, we argue. Why not? So Flexner asked us to think about this. Where are the conditions that are most likely to affect the public health? Where are the diversity and number of patients who have the conditions that affect the public health? these conditions being the ones that our students should learn. In his time, they were in inpatient venues. In our time, they're not patient venues. And this, by the way, is not an appeal to the discipline that I love so much. I love primary care. I, I, do, I spend my time um, working my best to do it to some standard. Um, but I will say that this is not an appeal to primary care at all. If someone is in a specialty, save a couple exceptions, if they're in neurology, they're not going to diagnose multiple sclerosis by doing it in the hospital. That's in the outpatient clinic. And in hemonc, patients are diagnosed typically in the outpatient clinics of their primary care doctors, or even if they're in hematology clinics, they typically send, spend the majority of their time in outpatient settings. Hopefully, they don't get admitted. Right? They get admitted, it's a rare thing. And you can go discipline by discipline by discipline across the core disciplines, and you can ask yourself, where are the majority of patients being evaluated and seen and cared for? And it's in the outpatient setting. It invites another question, though, not just the diversity of disease, not just where people have their first attempt at diagnosing. But in essence, you could also ask yourself, where do the faculty go? Where are they spending their time? There are wonderful faculty who spend their entire time in inpatient settings. They should be honored and thanked. The question, though, is, for the core disciplines that we think students should learn in their third year, in their principal clinical year, where are the faculty in those disciplines primarily seeing their own patients, doing the diagnosing, doing the chronic care management, doing the caring, ultimately? The faculty, like the patients, are in the outpatient setting for the diagnosis and the care and the ongoing relationships, even in the, the vast number of specialties. It's not an appeal to primary care. If you want to have a deep connection with patients, I guess we could give you two choices. Life is not binary, but let's just try for two choices for simplicity. So one choice could be in brief snapshots of patients you barely know and just met who are quite ill. Option two, 
longitudinally over time with patients you know really, really well who may or may not be ill. Option two seems to me, if you can be deeply connected to patients, it happens over substantial time. As I guess <laughs> I'm sort of chuckling to think about all the ways this comment is used, but relationships take time, right? So um, this is, I think, uh, appeal to the idea that when you're with patients longitudinally in any discipline, it's different than if it's in brief snapshots. Life is a movie, not a photograph, right? People are much more like movies, hopefully good movies, uh, not like photographs. Then there's the notion of ethical erosion. So I have this little habit, it, it, not, not just fast talking, not just the irrepressible need to go and go and go, but also the strange need to always talk about ethical erosion. So, so I've had friends joke at me, like, the talk Dave wasn't about ethical erosion at all, but you have got ethical erosion in there. Here we go again. All right, but this time I'm gonna summarize it much more briefly. Ethical erosion courtesy of Feutner and Christakis back in 1994, a term which actually should not be understood merely as ethics or ethical. That's the term they use, so we'll, we'll use it for now, but you'll see it means much more. Ethical erosion, the students, a, a student's decline in professionalism, let's think about what that word means, uh, related to clinical training. So here's how the literature has evolved, grossly, sort of roughly summarized. Students witness, participate in, have troubled feelings about, ethically unsound events or disturbing events in the clinical or their third year as they work on inpatient house officer-led teams. You see the paper referenced below. So in that paper, they actually uh, surveyed over 600 medical students in the six Eastern Pennsylvania medical schools. And as I showed on Monday when I spoke, and I, the paper's worth reading, the kind of ways students felt and the kind of things students saw are deeply disturbing. I'll just tell you without showing the bar graph, the shortest bar on the sort of the what students are exposed to and what do they feel bar graph was the bar where 32% of the students, this is the shortest bar, 32% of the students said they felt like an accomplice to a crime by their participation in the third year clerkships. That's the least problematic, not 32%. All right, on we go. Ethical erosion could also be understood not just by what they were exposed to or what their feelings are. This word professionalism could have much broader meaning. How about students decline in patient-centeredness? which seems to occur as a consequence of their third year and is different between the genders. Paul Hayden and colleagues did wonderful work in this regard and continue to do so. They thought of the ethical erosion not just being exposure or feelings, but rather what happens to the student-patient connection? What do students feel about patients? And they've shown that something troubling happens between students and patients. They used a validated instrument called the PPOS, Patient Practitioner Orientation Scale, PPOS, a validated measure to show that students' patient-centeredness declines and it's in their third year, in their clinical year. On it goes. Maybe it's not their feelings and their experiences. Maybe it's not patient-centeredness that defines ethical erosion or professionalism. Maybe it's their empathy. Students' vicarious empathy declined significantly in medical school and it seems to be a consequence of their third year. There are some wonderfully named articles. I chuckled because they're so, um, what would be the word for this? They're so clear, I suppose, in their, in their comments, in their depicting what they feel. For example, quote, is there a hardening of the heart in medical education? Is there a hardening of the heart in medical school? That's what Newton and colleagues asked. Or the devil is in the third year that, Ho <laughs> that Hojet and colleagues uh, say to us. Vicarious empathy declines as a consequence of medical school and in third year in particular. So there's another way of understanding ethical erosion. How about using Kohlberg's scale? Obviously, as we well know, it's been validated across time and place. We also know with Carol Gilligan's response to this that it had problems regarding um, its application to women. Nonetheless, a validated instrument of moral development, medical students show blunted moral development over three years compared to their age-matched peers not in medical school. All right, so we've got their experiences and their feelings. We've got patient-centeredness. We've got empathy. We've got moral development. I don't think that Kant, Mills, Hobbes, Hume, Rawls, who's, who's gonna like this one? Right? I think Carol Gilligan would go along and say this is disturbing nonetheless. We go, we go forward. Further studies, students' decline in moral development is related to medical professional training. It's not professional training. So we can ask, because it's, an easy, it's easy to say, yeah, you know what, but it's, it's just because they're in professional school. No, it appears it's because they're in medical school. Right? So she, she looked at thousands of students in several studies and showed that it's about medical school. We're not off the hook yet. Moral reason, reasoning among medical students is related to their development of more general competence, self-involvement. I like this one very much. It, it lets us not be off the hook around another notion, the notion of the very cruel or mean doctor, but he or she is really talented. It turns out he or she'd be really a lot more talented if they weren't so cruel, right? 
So we should not accept that. I think it's a false setup. The nice doctor who's incompetent versus the mean doctor who's competent, no way. It's the mean doctor who's competent, but is not nearly as good as they ought to be, versus the nice doctor who's competent, who's way better than the mean doctor who's competent. So we should think about that too. Then our colleagues in Texas, and my wonderful colleagues at UCSF, these are very fine people, I will say to you, they've also shown something quite disturbing, that unprofessional behavior among medical students does predict, in fact, subsequent unprofessional behaviors. And uh, the, uh, there's several references here to my, to my colleagues at UCSF, and you know, they, they know who goes before the California State Medical Board, and that some of that was predictable back in medical school. We can reject a lot of this stuff. It seems like we can reject ethical erosion in whole. We have to accept that it probably happens because of medical school, and it probably happens because of third year of clinical training, or whenever the year is. But probably you shouldn't accept it from me. Clearly, I'm overwrought about it. I can't stop talking about it. <laughs> but probably you can accept it from, from this story, a story that I, I dare say I think a lot of us are very familiar with. We've seen it in our relatives and friends. We've had it in ourselves. We've known it in our colleagues. Nurses know the story very, very well, as do the many other professionals who hang out around uh, clinical training. So let me try to see if this can go. Towards the end of my third year surgery rotation, I had the misfortune of witnessing one of those episodes that ended up cataloged in my mind under the heading, Terrible Unfair Things I Saw When I Was a Medical Student. My fellow medical student and I were called to take a complete history and physical of a patient who was described to us merely as a prisoner with anal abscesses. We went to conduct the history and physical and were met with a vulnerable 38-year-old man who gave us a history of significant unintentional weight loss over several months, chills, night sweats, diarrhea, unprotected sex with a fellow prisoner, and recurring abscesses unresponsive to numerous courses of antibiotics. Our physical exam confirmed fungating lesions spanning his abdomen, inner thighs, and buttocks. Normally, lesions like this would warrant incision and drainage in the operating room general anesthesia and the patient would be admitted to the hospital for further workup. However, when the attending physician was called, they refused to actually come into the hospital and examine the patient and instead directed us to drain the lesions ourselves in the outpatient setting and send the patient back to prison. It seemed that we had no choice. Reluctantly, my fellow student and I held the patient down as the resident drained the lesions in what must have been excruciatingly painful for the patient and felt to us like we were participating in torture. I can't help but wonder how the treatment might have been different if the patient had been an upper class professional rather than a homeless prisoner. Also wonder how my low status in the medical hierarchy might have influenced me to participate in this incident despite my better judgment. All right. So I think that is sort of ethical erosion in a nutshell. It certainly matches the Christakis and Feutner, Feutner and Christakis paper from the 1994. And maybe it explains some of the other papers in the time since. It's important to know this. You know her. You've met people like this. She's absolutely brilliant. She's a shimmering mind. She's the highest integrity and character among people I've met in my life, let alone among my students. She's got a PhD already, landmark research. She speaks a number of languages, is bouncy and bubbly, strong and brilliant, as I said, and she felt that disempowered. Which gives me the thought that since I'm nothing like that, I surely would have been disempowered, and I guess that most of us would have been disempowered, that it's not unique to her. This is a story about a person who felt like they were, quote, participating in torture, who actually had, she felt, the strength to respond and couldn't. So ethical erosion matters. That's my kind of simple summary. All right, then. We're going to go to the, the Middle Ages. Let me be contented in everything except in the great science of my profession. Never allow the thought to arise in me that I have attained to sufficient knowledge, but vouchsafe to me the strength, the leisure, and the ambition ever to ex extend my knowledge. For art is great, but the mind of men and women is ever expanding. The minds, the minds of men and women is ever expanding. All right, it definitely gets me fired up. Here's the problem. We're not doing this in medical education. We're not heeding the ancient call. Let's look at it again. Never allow the thought to arise in me that our schools have attained sufficient quality, 
but vouchsafe in the people who lead our schools and in all of us the strength, the leisure, and the ambition ever to extend the quality of our schools, if only to stem ethical erosion, if not for improving the competence of our students and their capacity to serve society. If only for ethical erosion, heck. For art is great, but the minds of leaders of medicine who run schools and all of us who work in schools probably are ever expanding, even when it comes to medical education. All right, I don't presume to have solved Maimonides' request, and I don't presume to be, have any particular strength around making change either. I do think it's kind of fun, though, to imagine what it might be like if we were to try to change schools. So here we see a classic model. Let's think of the colors as being different disciplines. Students do block rotations in inpatient settings, in tertiary hospitals typically, in random sequence on house officer-led teams. How many hyphens, by the way, in this? Oof. I tried to write in a sentence recently for an article I looked at it and said, there's no way around this, bad sentence. How about medicine, surgery, OBGYN, peds, or whatever? It could be peds, psych, neuro, medicine, whatever. Block rotations. We can add intercessions. Some schools have done this very successfully. We can do longitudinal themes like ethics, population health, cultural competence. There's all sorts of wonderful themes that can go through. We can add block ambulatory to the block basic structure, so a little more outpatient. We could add a longitudinal primary care clerkship where they actually go away to some ambulatory space serially for the course, the, across, the, across the entire year. We could do in and out, inpatient, outpatient, inpatient, outpatient again. There's some cool models of this. I'm going to take on the base structure. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what we did. There's the base structure. We thought, OK, we'll take these blocks and we'll tight, and we will turn them 90 degrees. So now we have colored blocks stacked on top of each other. And we're going to pull the blocks. We're going to pull the yellow and pull the blue below it, and pull the green and pull the red into streams. And then we're going to smudge the streams. Like that. I couldn't figure out the smudging. Even my friends who were very good at PowerPoint couldn't do the smudging. So you'll see there's small perforations between the, between the lines. All right. This was the notion of, of sort of the, the longitudinal integrated clerkship. The students would follow cohorts of patients, a cohort of patients in these disciplines over a substantial time with faculty in ambulatory settings and follow the patients across the venues of care. There's no such thing as a neuro patient. It's a person. It's a woman. There's no such thing as a psych patient. That's a person. That's a man. The psych patient can have surgery and the neuro patient can get pregnant, and, right? The patient is the site of integration, right? So the structure of education should follow that notion. Since I think I'm looking around, I think we're all people. I don't see any other mammals in the room. We already know this. I don't know why our, education structures, our educational structures don't follow the rationale that we ourselves would demand of our clinicians to see us as people first. I'm not getting preachy. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. So what do we try to do to, to sort of meet that logical standard? A year-long continuous educational environment with these continuities. Now, in the notion of the continuity of care, the, again, this, you'll see this kind of address the language of Flexner, but also the notions that Flexner was trying to, to get at. In fact, again, Flexner was kind of asking for these things although we threw on idealism because I couldn't help it. At least the first three. Flexner was getting at the first three, but he was saying you must do this in an inpatient setting because that's where you can best do these things. This program, I'm going to tell you, is not in any way sort of new. It's not been invented by us. In fact, it's entirely true to the word radical, as I said yesterday. Anyone for the, you may not answer today, you answered yesterday. Anyone for the, meaning, the true root of the word radical? Thank you. That was, that was a little trick, a little pedagogic trick there. You throw the word root into the question. The root of the word radical is root, meaning radical means the root. We're going backwards to a time gone by. We're trying to get back to the core principles that guided us 100 years ago. All we're doing is changing the venue. So to suggest that this is some kind of hip Cambridge thing, Dave is nuts, he's crazy, he loves this kind of stuff. No, 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 no. These are the transcendent values of people who are far more conservative than I, right? So let's, let's give it a go. Although I did throw in the idealism. All right. What is the Cambridge Integrated Clerkship, or HMS Cambridge Integrated Clerkship? It is a fundamental restructuring of, of clinical education, integrating all of the traditional clerkships, the ones that would be the core ones of the third year at our school, into one year-long clerkship, one thing, focused on longitudinal patient care, close mentoring, and collaborative learning. All right, so at this point, it sounds, very, it sounds like a lot of fun, but you're probably imagining, how is this possible? All right, so I, I, I um, borrowed slash stole this slide from uh, Malcolm Cox, who was the Dean of Medical Education at Harvard Medical School at the time the program started. He's a better slide maker than I am. The students act as a group practice. The students together are a group practice. They're also in a practice with their faculty in each of the disciplines, right? 
They're oriented to how the program works, and they start picking up a panel of patients. Here, I'm just trying to give the idea of a diverse panel of patients across the different disciplines. They learn as a team, a team within their office, a team with their faculty person, a team with the nurses in the office. They're a part of the delivery team of that particular office in that particular specialty discipline. That's true in neuro, it's, right, it's true in surgery. They also learn by themselves, lots of individual learning, the kind of learning that we do when we finish medical school. Spend a lot of our lives learning or talking to colleagues. This is the way it happens. We wanted the students to practice how they played, right, this sort of simple sporty notion. They follow patients inpatient and outpatient. Where the patient goes, the student goes. They cross venues. So there's plenty of inpatient. It's just inpatient from the view of the, from the, view of the patient, not from being stuck in the venue. And they run into all these other faculty and consultants. Now, there's this important question that arises from this. Aren't they not going to see what specialists do? They see what more what specialists do. They see what specialists do through the eyes of the patient, and they see multiple specialists on each, on each patient in the same way. So it's very interesting how they come to perceive what specialists do. I think it's quite authentic. The students say the same. But let's look at one discipline to make it a little easier. This is a cohort that represents a, um, a student's cohort in our first year of the program where they were given a patient with um, diabetes and vascular disease. Gray in this one means outpatient, yellow means inpatient. Another patient they were given a few days or a few weeks later with chronic lung disease. They met that patient inpatient, you see, and then followed the patient in and out. A patient with a stroke they met in the hospital. A patient with headaches who was never admitted. A patient with weight loss. This patient ended up having cancer and was only admitted at the end of the year. A patient with a lung nodule, which also ended up being cancer, the person was not admitted at all. That's where people present to the outpatient clinic, typically, or to the emergency department. And this, of course, you can, I can go on and on. The arrows, you know, they start a little later as the year goes on. We keep giving more patients who are more complex, expect more of the students as the year goes. And mind you, here I showed you internal medicine. You can imagine this in psychiatry or in neurology, diversifying a panel with adequately complex patients that will get admitted sometimes. They can pose increasing challenges to students over time. So imagine this in pediatrics and in neurology and so forth. They follow the patients through all the venues of care, and of course, they run into other faculty and consultants as they go. Uh, still, feeling kind of fun, but feeling kind of like, how would this ever be possible to do? So I'm obliged to show you this. I've altered this a little bit from the, um, the journal, the references below, but from the journal, but just make it a little more colorful and bright. We have them basically situated in outpatient clinics for the whole year. So this slice you see here might be one week. And then you can imagine another slice like this for the next week, the next week, the next week, the next week, the next week coming at you. All of a sudden, all those arrows you just saw are now facing you. Because they go to internal medicine clinic in the orange up there. Yeah, it's a Virginia orange. They go in the orange up there the whole year to their clinic. Now, mind you also, some of those patients from internal medicine might end up going to psychiatry. The students will often pop out of one clinic and pop into another. We had to design a bunch of pop out and pop in rules because they were popping in and popping out way too much. They were, fact, they were trying to go to every mammogram and every blood draw and every everything. That, clearly, that wasn't the point. We wanted them to be there for sentinel events. We also had to have the patients know what the students could and could not be there for, so patient expectations were, were fair. Patients end up loving this program, too. They, they end up wanting their own personal medical student every year hereafter. We have too many patients now, actually, to, uh, to um, suit all the, the small number of students that we have. Notice also the on-call is in emergency departments. So they're on call in two ways. One is they go to venues where, where patients are arriving. We want our students to be there for the beginning of the decision making. Not post hoc decision making, patient that was already seen and determined who ends up in the inpatient setting. No, the student should be there at the initial time because sometimes chest pain is cardiac. And sometimes chest pain is actually depression or anxiety. Sometimes chest pain is actually a survivor of trauma or it's involving the GI system, or the pulmonary system, or any number of things. The bottom line is, what do, what do um, clinicians do? They do that discerning. They do that discerning professionally. They use skills to do that discerning in real time. They don't quite, I think, usually receive a, pre, a post or an already discerned patient and have to add their, their redundant kind of contribution to it. We want the students in the front of all the decision making. So we call that whole illness episodes. They see Patients before diagnosis, during the course of things, and after discharge. Again, I, I probably don't say it as well as a student, so we'll let a student go. Lawrence is a friend of mine. She's also an avid bingo player, mother, and retired medical assistant who's been hospitalized 11 times in as many months. She's an 83-year-old woman with diabetes, hypertension, and severe peripheral vascular disease who I met at her interns, Dr. Lacey's I was a brand new third year medical student. 
She was struggling to breathe against 30 pounds of extra fluid. When Dr. Lacey told her that she needed to be admitted, she shook her head and said, I'm a worker, not a patient. Florence is a friend of mine, and she's feisty. Since July, Florence has weathered hospitalizations for CHF, cellulitis, osteomyelitis, TIA, stroke, peripheral revascularization, transmetatarsal amputation, anemia, urosepsis, and an upper GI bleed. Dr. Lacey tells me that if I understand Florence, I understand all of medicine. As her student, I have crossed menus and disciplines, from cardiology to infectious disease, neurology, vascular surgery, podiatry, hematology, nephrology, and gastroenterology. She has kept me running between the library, clinics, wards, and operating rooms since the day we met. As a student in the integrated clerkship, I've had the privilege of following Florence through her medical journey and the opportunity to give back. In November, I was paged to the ER where Florence had presented with one day of right-sided weakness and slurred speech. I was able to tell the attending that her marked facial droop was due to an old Bell's palsy. After a brief conversation with Florence, I was also able to tell him that she had developed a new Broca's aphasia. In March, Florence was found to have a hematocrit of 17%. As we waited for endoscopy, I noticed that she also appeared slumped, as if she were favoring her right side. While I reassured her about the endoscopy, I examined her right side and found a large, tender pectoral hematoma. She recalled hearing a pop when we moved from a stretcher to her favorite chair, but felt too silly to call attention to, as she put it, a breast swollen up like someone shoved a deck of cards in there. The extent of Florence's influence is coming clear. I've heard traditional third-year students describe their horror at the sight and smell of necrotic feet in vascular clinic. But it has never occurred to me to be disgusted by Florence. I remember seeing the first signs of an ulcer on her toe. I was there when erythema gave way to necrosis and osteomyelitis. But it was all happening to my friend, Florence. So when it was time to amputate her forefoot, I just wanted to do right by her, to find vital tissue. You see, Florence is a real woman, with real troubles, joys, and fears. When her wounds need tending, I tend them. I don't worry about whether they're gruesome or hopeless. The integrated clerkship has taught me to focus on the tasks for which I came to medical school, to serve the person with and beyond the disease. So that student um, is in a top five surgery program. She did not go to medical school to become a surgeon. She found the, her way to surgery through, as she's described it to me on a number of occasions, through the humanism of it. She thought it was a, um, an elegant way of relieving suffering through connecting to people. Turns out she has mastery in the, in the manual skills as well. These things go together. There's no such thing as a field that, that does or does not do humanism. Right? So it's interesting. Um, did you hear the, the use of my friend again and again? Because it strikes me as interesting. I think it's worthy of discussion. So I'll, I'll finish with only a couple, couple more slides, and then we should get into um, any number of these voiceovers or anything else you would like to get into. To answer the question of do we build the program we intended to build, I'll just take a, on the side here. People could ask, so did your students actually see patients before diagnosis and after discharge? Did they have meaningful connection to the patients? Did they feel like they made a real difference to the patients? Were they taught by faculty? Did they have more hours of faculty teaching time than they would have had in another model? Did they enjoy the quality of feedback from faculty? Who was the primary um, feedback givers? Things like this. We wanted to make sure we had built the program we intended to build that had those continuities in mind, that had the, the educational pillars in mind. So my colleague Ed Krupat and a bunch of us got together, also his colleague Steve Pelletier, they, um, they helped us create a plan by which we could judge whether we had succeeded in at least making what we thought we'd make and whether our students would be safe and doing, do okay. Sort of a do no harm thing was hanging over our heads too, no doubt. So what they did was students applied to the integrated clerkship and they were chosen at random out of a, <laughs> I should say out of a hat, it's actually out of a paperclip bowl, but whatever. They were chosen at random in the first year by computer in the years that came, but it was random. Students who did not get the integrated clerkship, who applied to it but did not get it, they were the first people to become the comparison group. So I should say that students were not randomized in the class, and they were not randomized in the draw. But they were chosen at, they were chosen at random, and the majority of the comparison group was people who sought the clerkship and didn't get it. Um, we threw in a few more people into the comparison group, students who had a strong interest in medical education, right? So they were thrown into the comparison group as well to make a larger comparison group. And then we compared those two groups. Now we compared them along a bunch of lines because again, it wasn't randomized, so we had to make sure the groups were not somehow different. Their MCAT scores were no different. Their part one of the boards were no different. 
the ASCII scores and the subcomponents of our second year ASCII at Harvard, they were no different. They were no different in their um, view of patient-centeredness using the validated instrument. And they were no different in their future practice choices or, or things they sought to go into. We couldn't find any differences between the two groups. And again, they had pr primarily both sought an integrated clerkship, so we did the comparison. And it turns out with p-values all less than 0.05, our students more often saw patients before diagnosis. Our students more often saw patients uh, after discharge. These were not even, if those who were there on Monday, these the towers are not even close on these. Meaningful connection to patients, making a real difference in your patient's health, whether the feedback was from faculty, how many hours of feedback from faculty, all of these things. The quality of the feedback, all the P's are less than 0.05, our students compared to the comparison group. So in the very least, we, it seems like we made a faculty taught program in which students could see patients before, during, and after diagnosis and follow patients longitudinally in a meaningful way that made a real difference to the patients from the, from the view of the student. Okay, so we made the program we intended to make. Did we do harm? Well, we hoped that our students would do no worse on the standard content exams from the NBMA. So we compared the, at the time, there were four shelf exams or NBMB content exams at Harvard, uh, psychiatry and pediatrics and surgery and OBGYN. And we can, I can give you the three-year data, which is that the students in the Cambridge clerkship, um, if you add all those shelves together, it's a P of less than 0.05, the, our, the Cambridge group compared to the comparison group. That truth was true after the first year. So there was no founder's effect. We can debate, by the way, if there's any social scientists here as to whether the founder's effect does or does not exist, whether the Hawthorne effect is or is not true, whether the Hawthorne effect would apply more to our students than the comparison group. The fact is, it was true in the first year, it was true in the years throughout, it's true in aggregate that our students, the sum of their shelf exams, which you can sum up, they're just multiple choice questions. After all, part two of the boards is just the sum of shelf exam questions, after all, right? So, but how about in the individual shelves? All the trends are towards Cambridge. The pediatric shelf has a P of less than 0.05. The psychiatry shelf has a P of less than 0.05. It's four shelf exams over three years. It's 12 total shelf exams. Nine of the 12 were heavily to, to Cambridge. The other three were insignificantly different. So we weren't trying to do that, but maybe Baldwin and Self's article that sort of adult development or moral development or whatever we want to call that does covary with competence. Maybe that's what we're seeing. Maybe in fact there's no difference in content knowledge. I don't know. But clearly we didn't do any harm in the shelf exams, nor did we do it in the, um, in the Harvard's fourth year comprehensive OSCE. It's a make or break test. You have to pass it to pass Harvard. With a P of less than 0.05 in the first year, with a P of less than 0.05 in the three year aggregate and so on, the Cambridge students were different and better than the comparison group. All of which is very interesting. None of which is the reason we did the integrated clerkship. The reason we did the integrated clerkship goes back to all that ethical erosion stuff I was showing you earlier. So the real question for me actually wasn't this. It was whether they'd be somehow different in their perceptions or attitudes or their values. And we surveyed them according to those questions too. And I, again, I showed a lot of this on Monday, but I can summarize just a few points here. Lots and lots and lots of difference with P's of less than 0.05 across the comparisons. Cambridge students, for example, were more, felt more able to deal with uncertainty, felt more able to deal with a diverse patient population, felt, felt more able to deal with problems that had no easy answers, felt more able to understand the patient's perspective or the healthcare system, okay. and on and on it goes. But that's actually just their feelings. They might not be actually more able in any of those regards. So we should take those as being interesting that they felt that way, and maybe that's a testimony to their satisfaction. With a P of less than 0.05, they were more satisfied. Maybe they're more satisfied because it's actually easier. It turns out when you ask students whether it's too easy or too hard, Cambridge students and the traditional students equally said it's just right. But if you then ask them, is it too easy or is it too difficult, the Cambridge students were far more likely to say it's too difficult, and the traditional students were far more likely to say it's too easy. So it wasn't about how easy or hard it was, it seems to me. Maybe the environment was really lovey-dovey. It's huggy. We're in Cambridge. Maybe it's that. Cambridge students with a P of less than 0.05 are more likely to call it stressful. With a P of less than 0.05, are more likely to call it hectic. And equal with the comparison group, they were, they were likely to call it frustrating. But they also called it, as I said, more satisfying. They also called it with a P of less than 0.05. And for all the, all the remaining things I'm going to list now, they, with a P of less than 0.05, yeah, it was less marginalizing. It was more confidence building. It was more satisfying. And it was more transformational. And it was more rewarding. So. That's good. It wasn't too huggy, I guess, and maybe it was hectic and stressful, but somehow it gave them more. But these are still perceptions. We're not free of the perception problem yet. So back to the validated instrument of patient-centeredness, which I'm assuming is the entire reason Marsha invited me here. Um, 
In fact, the title of the program that you so wished for had to do with the word patient and student connected. So using Paul Hayden Ed Krupad's tool, the PPOS, the validated measure of patient centeredness, we looked at the difference. There was no difference at the beginning. At the end, the P was less than 0.05. There was a difference. The Cambridge students went up, and consistent with all the literature, the traditional students went down. I think whenever we go anywhere around this beautiful globe of ours, people are most moved by that, that using a validated instrument in patient-centeredness, notwithstanding any of the other accomplishments, students get more patient-centered, and they're not otherwise harmed. All right. Still not good enough to hear from me. So let me try one last voiceover and see if this can maybe be compelling us to, I think it's emblematic of how our students understand the program, so I'll give it a try. It's like I just took all those real human feelings and emotions contained in that patient-doctor interaction, and I crammed them, reorganized them, and dehydrated them to fit into a succinct little box. Often, the content of a note or presentation depends more on what the attending wants to hear than on what the patient has told me, especially if the attending is more biomimically oriented. I sometimes get angry just thinking about this, but I also see the need to be able to do this. Efficiency, uniform standards, and objective representation of patients are essential to providing the best patient care. Now, at the end of my third year, I've come to the point where it's easy to sum up a patient's case in a few lines. But I still feel the importance of seeing the patient's person as a whole entity, and I hope never to forget how to do that. As soon as I'm asked to follow oh. No, no, don't go against that one. Giving a presentation or writing a patient note. Yes. A betrayal of the patient's life and story, and a betrayal of the genuine interaction I just had with that patient. I may have just spent an hour with this person. It's kind of funny to have it looping because um, it is, for me, looping in my head. Um, that and the other stories, and the countless other stories that I haven't played for you today. I just want to thank my colleague, Liz Galfberg, who does, has done such a wonderful job at collecting stories and doing the voiceovers and so forth. If any of you know Liz Galfberg, she is magnificent at thinking about the, the core essence, the core humanism in, in medicine, and she runs the reflective practice curriculum that, that runs as one of our streams along the year. So we'll close with the IOM. Probably not Maimonides, but maybe on par with Flexner. All right. Among all of the academic health center roles, educate, um, education will require the greatest changes in the coming decade. We regard education as one of the primary mechanisms for initiating a cultural shift towards an emphasis on the needs of patients and populations and a focus on improving health using the best of science and the best of caring. Okay, so we have lots to play with. I'm, ha I'm absolutely happy to work on notions of how the hinge critical relationship works, which is fine. Although, I, it strikes me that in this crowd, if I understand correctly from my inviters, that it might be that we want to think more about the notions that the students presented, this use of the word friend and the boundaries and rule implications for that comment, or the many other ways in which we can understand how patients experience this program, how students experience this program, um, the deep human aspects that seem to be weaving student and patient together in a different way. Thank you, David, so much. Um, I think we have uh, lots of time for your questions, and we can develop a, a good conversation with David here. Um, please identify yourself when you ask your question. Thank you so much. My name is Bernard Williams. I went to medical school here also. For those of us that uh, chose to go out and practice medicine after medical school, you're talking about starting a practice in medical school, um, which I think is a wonderful idea. Recently, I went through um, my old records, uh, patient records, and, and destroyed them after many years, many years after I finished my practice. 
and uh, it was like going to a funeral. Mm -hmm. um, also recently, I worked in a, in a I volunteered in a, a community a free clinic, and I was shocked to find out that patients weren't seen by the same doctor. You know, uh, I just couldn't, and I told them I couldn't do that because it's totally in, incongruent with practicing. But my question to you is, why, why not start the practice in the first year rather than the third year? I mean, the first two years are so horrible <laughs> that, I mean, there's no connection to patients. And it's hard to learn anything under those circumstances. So I think we ought to start the practice in medical school the first day. And under the supervision, of course, of our uh, mentors, and I think everybody would have a lot more fun, and the outcomes would be a lot better. So I uh, thank you for this comment. I completely agree. I can't say it nearly as well, um, but I completely agree. And there are others who completely agree. So there's a wonderful um, idea from David Irby and all the colleagues at UCSF, and there are many <laughs> such wonderful people who work at that medical school who are thinking about a model that essentially challenges the notion that we all Understand. So I'll give a name to our model. We'll call our model the two plus two, right? Two years of basic science, two years of clinical science, or in some schools maybe it's 1.5 slash 2.5, whatever, right? But it's two medical schools. And so some people are asking, why not make one medical school? Why not have them doing patients and science simultaneously throughout their time in medical school? Kind of like life is after you finish medical school, right? It has in that several things. For those who, who revere science, and we should, they get to learn science, the translational aspects of science, deeply connected to patients. Why do the world's best researchers do research probably? Because they want to end human suffering. They don't want to just work on little cool things. They want to end human suffering. If they wanted to work on little cool things, they probably wouldn't do biomedical science. They would do some other science. So for science, it makes sense to connect it to humans, because that taps into, I think, to the core values of researchers and scientists. For clinicians, why do we choose medicine? Because, well, we will love science, too. But we're, of course, very connected to the idea of ending human suffering through the care of patients. So the singular notion is not that we should have 2 plus 2, but rather, how about 3 plus 1, where the 3 is one entity. It's one med school, science and service simultaneously. Science and patient care from the beginning, throughout three years. The fourth year could be for remediation of students who can't do it in 3. It could be for internship for students who are highly competent and ready to go after 3. Should not our society turn out people into practice earlier if they could be? We, Lord, Lord knows, we, we need people <laughs> moving along and less debt. How about people who want to do their MPH or MPP or MBA or any other set of three letters they want to do in graduate school or want to do research or want to go across the seas? They can do that in the, in the plus one year. But the notion of three plus one is the three. And you can start from the beginning, just as you exactly asked us to think about, the beginning with patient care and science simultaneously. Now, whereas 3.1 is now being delivered, 3.1, 3 plus 1, oh my goodness, Microsoft does that. Did you hear that? Um, 3 plus 1 is being deliberated at, um, at UCSF. But some schools are starting not doing 3 plus 1, but they're starting the idea nonetheless. So for example, this beautiful new medical school at Hofstra, where David Battinelli and Larry Smith are, are combining with a wonderful team to make this new school in Great Neck. I think that's, I mean, it's, it's out there <laughs> um, on Long Island. They're starting very, very early with their students seeing patients, meaning day one, meaning they're training all their students to be EMTs upon arrival, certified for New York State. Those aren't for fun ride-alongs. Those are to care for my patients from the beginning. That's to do service from the beginning. So when you're learning science, there's Ms. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so to imagine who you cared for, whom you cared for, right? So I think you're exactly right on. The next holy grail maybe is to think about how to do med schools that do clinic, clinical work from the beginning or to have longitudinal residencies, perhaps. Hi, I'm uh, John Abelson, a second year medical student. Uh, I would actually argue that it's really only the last two months of second year that are horrible, <laughs> but I can argue about that later. Uh, my question is actually if, uh, if you guys are doing any follow-up uh, look and following the students to see if uh, this no uh, notion of ethical erosion is sustainable. Right, exactly. So the Gold Foundation, which is the foundation that does humanism and medicine so brilliantly, um, has funded my colleague, Elizabeth Goutberg, to do that very study. 
So she, she is now in the process of studying the graduates of our program and, we hope, the comparison group um, while they're in their residencies now and to find out what their perspectives on things are. So that's very, very interesting. It'll involve um, interviews and surveys and a, mm. a series of cool things. Um, so that's what's happening where we don't have data yet. What, where we do have data, and I say that was sort of a wink because the sum of anecdotes is not data, but boy is it fun. Um, we have all of these emails and phone calls and all of the ways in which the graduates are contacting us, telling us story after story of the things that happened in their third year that are, are now important to them in their residencies or something they learned from third year. I know that clerkship directors and those who teach in third year and traditional blocks also have students who love their experience. I, I, I was one of them, right? I love my experience. But I, I would say that there's something different about these stories. What's even more fascinating, what's more interesting is the metacognition of our graduates, where they say, where they recognize there's something different about their stories when compared to the stories of their classmates and co-residents. So anecdotes are not data, I concede again. But I just want to say that it's really fulfilling and refreshing to understand, at least from the, the um, students who are contacting us, how they sort of live on. Recently, there's a school, what's that school called in Durham, the one with the blue? At, um, so, Duke is now contemplating doing a longitudinal integrated clerkship. Um, theirs is for the purpose of advocating for primary care training. Ours was just to uh, have our students hopefully stem ethical erosion and learn more. Our students, our students, by the way, go into the same disciplines as all the other students at Harvard. They get the same level of residency matches. They get their first choices at the same rate. There's no difference between our graduates and the other graduates at Harvard, but we weren't intending to make differences. All over the world, people use this program to train for primary care, or for rural health, or for um, workforce for a given state or a province. We, we just try to have our students have this nice experience. But at Duke, they're trying to do it for primary care. And recently, Duke asked us, you know, could we talk to some of your students? So I sent out the little, dear students who graduated from our program, would you want to talk to people from Duke? So if any of you want to see, come to my email later, and I can show you the responses I got, anything you ever want to talk about the program was, uh, was this core essence of all the responses I got. Anything we can do, I'd love to talk to Duke. Hooray, congratulations, we're, met, we're on the move. On, on it goes. So the students are absolutely, they have evangelical zeal. Hi, my name is Ivan Logan from Neurology. Um, throughout your, your fine talk, you kept using one word over and over again, and that was the word patient. Um, our administration here is insidiously starting to use the word customer. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us what you think about that, please? What, I just, as a, as a teacher, I think it would be so much fun right now to say, well, what do you think about that? <laughs> but, but I think I know. No, no please. I, I think it's terrible I and disgraceful. <laughs> yeah, my, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I guess for me, it ha it ha everything has to do with valence. And so we can, if you want to do a close your eyes exercise, we could do this together. If I close my eyes and imagine patience, for me, there's something gloriful or transcendent. There's something beautiful in it. And there's something unimaginably sacred in it. And then I just offer you the question of closing your eyes and imagining the word customer and see if you have the same feeling. Is that, a, is that fair? I don't want to scrutinize the school to give me the diploma, but I think, I, think, I think patient it is. Since we brought the patient up, could I quickly ask, do uh, any of the people connected with the clerkship get feedback from the patients about the student's performance? And then from one year to the next, do the same patients participate? And so do they have experience of different students? <laughs> yes. So, oh, oh, is that, oh, very, oh, you two should we, meet. We are thinking yes, a yes. Okay. Marsha, Jean, Jean, Marsha. Yeah. Um, the, so yeah, the, so the, the patients do clamor to return to have students again. The patients do comment with zest and vigor and clarity about their experience of their students, and they do so, so oftentimes to the student in front of the faculty person, sometimes to the faculty person without the student there. We've had very, very, very few problems between student and patient, and those have been sort of readily handled just by the doctor in whose office the student is working. That I was, you guys have heard me say, those of you who were at the other talks, um, with one, I don't speak Spanish so well, or hardly at all, but I can do enough to say, mis angeles, my angels, is the way that the patients will often refer to our students. And the other thing that I like to report is when the students sometimes pop out of our hospital, they go up to one of the big hospitals downtown, sometimes they actually pop out of the Harvard system they go over to Boston University or Tufts. And they go to these other medical school, schools and are, arrives the patient, arrives the student. The doctor has no idea about this program. Who is this person coming with the patient? So into the room goes the patient with their student. And the doctor will say, this is the, I've got some wonderful stories in this regard. So, so I'm sorry, who are you? You're the daughter? You're the, you're the, who are you? You're their personal medical student, what? And, then the, <laughs> and the patient will say, here's the deal. 
I'm having this visit with my student or I'm not having this visit. So the students end up being simultaneous English to English translators, right? <laughs> Importantly, that's another role question. Just like the students cannot be friends, we have a whole curriculum that's been developed to help them understand they are not friends. And it came out of actually this particular story you heard. A whole boundaries and role uh, curriculum, which I have on DVD here, which we can look at later if you want to, or we can hang out and do it tomorrow. We also have a, an interesting issue about not speaking on behalf of your patient, right? You're, you're an anthropologist servant. You're, you're certainly not the voice of the patient. Hi, uh, Patrick Upchurch, uh, second year medical student. Hi. Um, knowing that ethical erosion exists in a traditional model of teaching among third year students, what do you advise soon to be third year students on how to avoid ethical erosion, how to maximize their learning experience, and sort of getting this, having this mindset of longitudinal care and patient-centeredness with, while still being in a traditional style of teaching? I, have, I, have, I don't know the answer. I don't know that, I don't, I don't, I, I know some data. The more instruction that happens, for example, the less likely people erode and so forth. People can erode and bounce back, right? And, um, people can erode and not bounce back, right? But the, the thing that I think is important from the way that I frame it is like this. Number one is just as in life, we need tethers. We need tethers to the good things that help us be who we are. So, I, I mean, obviously you can't, you can't shop for your own parents. So some things are predetermined, it seems to me. But you can tether yourself to ideals and principles. And there's, lot, there's lots of thoughts about how you might do that. There's another thought that and I, I believe I should, for this one I should credit Professor Ron Heifetz or Professor Marty Linsky of the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I forget, I think it's them, and I think it's in one of their books, and I forget. But they like to have this idea that when you're thinking about change, you should imagine yourself on the dance floor and in the balcony, right? You should try to see if you can understand the whole dance as it's happening from, from above, even as you're dancing on the dance floor. And so I suppose there's many ways of tethering. That could be friends and family and write letters to yourself. There's lots of ways of doing that maintaining fitness and poetry and arts and the things that make you who you are that are um, not your medical self. But I suppose also there's something about metacognition, trying to see for what it really is and what it really isn't. You are not your job. I take very seriously the work of Bob Keegan, who's at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, and in his beautiful books, he tries to have us understand this idea of, quote, joining the discourse community. I put on my little jacket here, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm like education speaker now. I'm not an education speaker. I'm Carol and Mike Hirsch's kid. Right? I mean, that's who I am. Right? I like education. I like being a doctor. I'm very into those things. I want to do them to a high standard. But there's, the other me is the me. So I think we should all probably try to make sure that we separate the me from what I do. Uh, and that would be a hard task for anyone. It's a hard task for the integrated clerkship as well. But knowing that it is a task, I think, is the first very important step. Um, I think we have one, time for one more quick question. Thanks. Rob Morris, Chaplain Resident. Question. Uh, I'm wondering, first of all, the program you have looks eerily familiar. Uh, if you haven't studied clinical pastoral education, you might take a look at it. Please, yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering how your students process their experience uh, in conversation with one another. Do you have fora for that? I, I love this question. And I would, and I would I'd be delighted. I think one of the most important things we should do in, in education, in medical education, and even just in doctoring and not in education, is to, to please step outside of ourselves and try to get knowledge from afar. So I would, I would very much value knowing literature or places I could read about this. The students' group practice idea, we did not invent purposefully. We did not even think about, and I'm embarrassed to say it. So. We, I, many of you know about these sentinel relationships, and I, I apologize again, I can't get the reference for the student, patient, student, 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 faculty, student society, student self. Anyone with the reference, please? You got the relationships anyway. To the author of this, if I'm on video, I apologize, I forget the reference. Um, it's a wonderful notion. The student-student one we had not thought of so deliberately. What happens is, yes, they're all in their own clinics. Yes, they all have their own faculty. Yes, they all have their own patient panels. But what happens is we gave them a space. I think my friend, Fred Hafferty, who I know came here, we proud of the idea that we created a context in which they could sit in their development and share their struggles together. So we put all of the desks in one room with computers in one room with their own drawers. They have their own uh, desks that look like they're kind of, <laughs> some of them are completely disastrously messy and some of them are very crisp. 
But the bottom line is they're sharing the struggle together. It is not so much, I'm going to do something, I'm going to use you as my prop. It's not so much, look at me, I'm better than my colleague, right? It's we, right? It's very, very different. It's collaborative and collegial. And the truth is, it's collaborative and collegial around the fact that it's so stressful. This developing, trying to, the other understanding of the self and of the profession and trying to care for my patients. It turns out that a lot of the other students know a ton about the other students' patients. And sometimes they actually will cross cover. So if a student's away, the other student will see the patient. So they've invented all of these things out of the, again, I, I don't think, they do far better at making this thing happen than anything we could ever do by design. But I think this is a beautiful way of, of reimagining how you can create context and create relationships and create community um, if you just sort of get out of the way. And if those things are set up according to principles, I think the good things happen. We've had uh, a wonderful conversation for this hour with um, our former student, and I dare say we've learned a lot. Um, so um, please join me again in thanking David Hirsch and in recognizing him as our first um, winner of the Brody Medical Education Award.